Oh yeah, it's Pikmin 2 time. Now the rules for this challenge are pretty simple. I can only use one of each Pikmin type. However, in Pikmin 2, this means that we'll have a maximum of five Pikmin as opposed to the first game's three, which I felt gave me a bit too much of an advantage. So I've decided to make the challenge a little bit harder by also giving myself a 20 day time limit forbidding turning in enemies for money and reducing the item submission range from the entire landing site to just the ship's tractor beam. So uh, yeah, no, it's gonna be way worse. So without further ado, let us answer the question. Is it possible to beat Pikmin 2 with only one of each Pikmin? And also all these things. We start off in the snow zone, where we expertly crash land our ship straight into a godforsaken tutorial area. This place sucks so bad, the first hour of gameplay is almost entirely scripted, and none of the things that the game wants us to learn how to do is possible with just one guy. We have to kill this bulb orb, which we can't do until we whistle all five of the default boys here. Then we gotta crush this bag, which requires 15 of the little buggers. And then finally, we have to carry back our first bit of treasure and end the day, which, to no one's surprise, requires a little more than just one Pikmin. Obviously, this is a terrible situation, or at least it would be if collecting this treasure was the only way to end the day. That's right, we're gonna be busting straight out of this tutorial, and the way we're gonna do it involves the help of our old friend Stefan. Oh no no Stefan, we don't play with the other kids. Anyway, Stefan is gonna be a huge help to us, as we can use him to do a really nifty trick here. I go ahead and grab him and then carry him over to this specific corner. I can then very carefully turn around and throw him to get him completely stuck inside the wall. From there, I can move around the wall and whistle him so he starts to walk towards me. And since he's inside the wall right now, this makes him walk into an area that he's not supposed to be. And interestingly, there's actually an out of bounds bag in this area that, when activated by Stefan, actually triggers the end of the day early. And <laughs> yeah, no, that's a complete lie. There's no Nothing here and Stefan just immediately falls to his death. However, this still does exactly what we want. Since we avoided whistling the other kids in the beginning, killing just Stefan here tricks the game into thinking all of our Pikmin have died, which ends the day early with a Pikmin extinction, completely skipping over all of the tutorial nonsense and propelling us straight into the real meat of the challenge. Now that we're on day two and we've been reunited with our friend, Louie, and the real red Pikmin homie, Stephanie, we can start talking about what we gotta do to beat this game. Now, as stupid and dumb as the tutorial is, it still had the right idea. We gotta collect treasures and take them to our ship. There are a ton of these things, and all of them are valued at a certain amount of coinage, and our primary goal is to collect a grand total of 10,000 bucks worth of them. Unfortunately, we can't really do any of that with only one guy, so our first main goal is gonna be to assemble our troops by first exploring every area and finding all five of the Pikmin types. The one we want the most is our purple dude, who's luckily located really close by in the Emergence Cave. Unluckily though, this cave in particular is blocked not only by that bag we didn't crush yesterday, but also another identical secondary bag that requires even more weight in Pikmin. Obviously, neither of those things are gonna happen, so instead we're gonna have to take the back route, which involves somehow getting up and over this ledge. And this is only possible with the help from my good friend Jimmy. <gasps> Oh my god! <laughs> this is the bulb warp jump, and if you're wondering why I had such a strong reaction to getting it, that's because it took me four hours to do. As it turns out, Jimmy is weak, and he's stupid, and his bite force is nowhere near as strong as his father's. This means that, in order to get the height needed to make it up here, we need to perfectly lodge ourselves in between him and the wall as he's attacking to generate as much squish energy as possible, which can then be directly converted into upwards momentum, kind of like this. Oh yeah, you also need to time a frame-perfect punch because for some reason that does something. But once we're up here, we can, uh, switch to Louie, which isn't working for some reason, make our way to the cave's entrance, descend a couple, oh, uh, couple of its floors, and finally come across the purple flowers. All we gotta do is toss Stephanie in there and we should, uh, we should have our purple, <laughs> how'd that happen? What's going on here? What is continuing to happen? Why can't I switch between my captains? Why is the camera doing weird stuff? And why in the world can't I make purple Pikmin? Oh no. Oh God, don't tell me we're still. Yeah, so as it turns out, we can't just mosey on past the tutorial and pretend like it's fine afterward. No, the game is utterly confused at what we've done, and in its current state, it's almost entirely unplayable. That list of things I brought up earlier, that wasn't just me making up arbitrary steps for what you usually do on day one, no. These are all specific events that each trigger some extremely important flags in the game's code. For example, finding our first treasure usually triggers a bunch of cutscenes that show you why they're important, which is why the camera goes haywire when the first treasure we find isn't the one we're supposed to. 
killing Jimmy here is what usually switches our perspective to Louis, which means that we don't have the ability to switch captains until he's dead. But the weirdest and most important trigger of them all is crushing this dang bag. Now, I don't have the game's code in front of me, so I can't actually tell you what crushing this bag exactly does, but I can tell you what not crushing it does. Uh, it breaks everything. This isn't just bad for the challenge, by the way, it's bad for the game. And as far as I can tell, skipping this bag makes it unbeatable. Which means that, unfortunately, making the 15 Pikmin necessary to crush it is unavoidable. And the challenge is impossible. But come on, man, I literally just got done showing that I totally can skip the bag without Pikmin. Like, it's not actually in my way or anything, and it's not my fault the game breaks when I do. So I think making one exception to my rules to crush this stupid bag and make the game actually playable is perfectly fair. Plus, the game doesn't even count the Pikmin you make on day one, so what, you're gonna call the game a cheater now? But anyway, even breaking my own rules is an issue, because when and where am I gonna make these Pikmin to crush the bag? Like I've said, trying to play through day one normally requires that we kill Jimmy, because he unlocks our ability to switch cap and make 15 Pikmin. But Jimmy stays dead, so we wouldn't be able to use him for the ball orb jump on the next day. On the flip side, if we skip day one and try to make the guys we need on day two, then yeah, Jimmy's alive and we can do the jump, but the onion will spawn in the landing site, where there actually aren't enough pellets to make 15 Pikmin and crush the bag. Trust me, that second one's not an option. We need to make these guys on day one. But then what do we do with Jimmy? He can't be both dead and alive at the same time. How are we gonna find a timeline in which Jimmy died so we can switch captains, but is somehow still alive so we can use him for the jump? Well, what if we just reverse the timeline? If we skip day one and kill Jimmy on day two, then we still trigger the flag that gives us the ability to switch captains. From there, I can reset the game back to day one, effectively turning back to a time where Jimmy is still alive, but the flag for killing him is still triggered. So now I have the ability to switch captains, but Jimmy lives. At that point, I can switch to Louie across the map, make the guys that apparently don't count, crush the ever-important bag, and stow away all but just one of my Pikmin. Now is when the challenge truly begins. So as I was saying a year ago, before we do anything rash, we should first put all of our effort into exploring the world and finding each of our Pikmin types to build up our army. So after spending another four hours getting this godforsaken bulb orb jump to work, we were able to enter the emergence cave once again and meet the purple guy, Bill. Bill is absolutely insane. Here's a quick list of Bill's weaknesses. All right, now here's a list of all of his strengths. Firstly, Bill is fat. This means that throwing him turns him into a freaking homing missile that either damages, stuns, or just straight up insta-kills any enemy he lands on. Secondly, the damage output from even his regular hits is crazy, which not only makes killing enemies even easier, but it also makes walls and whatnot break even faster. Thirdly, his speed, which is supposed to be his major flaw, is actually really beneficial for us, as it allows us to more precisely pull off tricks that we'll see later in the challenge. But finally, his best strength by far is, well, his strength. Bill is 10 times stronger than any of the other dweebs, which means that he's able to carry most objects in the entire game by himself, which in a game where carrying objects is the whole point, it's pretty good. Hey, speaking of objects we need to carry, this is the Spherical Atlas. It's one of the treasures we need, and collecting it allows us to unlock the next area of the game, so it's a pretty dang important one at that. However, even though the word spherical is really hard to say, carrying this thing back to our ship is still easier said than done. It weighs 101 pounds, and even with Bill added to our roster, our combined carrying strength right now is frickin' 11. This means that we're gonna have to pull out some trickery to transport this thing to our ship without directly carrying it. And that trickery comes in the form of a little technique I like like to call Pikmin nudging. Sure, Bill's not strong enough to carry the Atlas itself, but he's perfectly capable of carrying these nearby bulb orbs. So by baiting the enemies behind the object we want to transport, we can make some magic happen. Now, although this seems pretty great, it's actually terrible. It's literally impossible to perfectly line things up, so most of the time every enemy is going to push the object like three inches before it gets misaligned and stops working. And since there aren't an infinite number of enemies in the cave, we gotta find a way to keep the object straight the entire time. Luckily, so long as there are at least two nearby enemies that we can bait over, we can make it work by setting up one of the enemies on the left side of the object and the other on the right. With this setup, I can utilize the slight differences in their pathfinding to continuously keep the object lined up as I constantly switch between the corpses. And inch by inch, I can transport the object closer and closer to our ship until we finally reach it. And yeah, it doesn't actually collect it. This is the case in every Pikmin game. Just getting an object to your ship isn't enough. The game really, really wants you to have the required number of Pikmin to be currently carrying it before it gets officially submitted. However, 
I think this is dumb. Like with the bag, it's not my fault the game won't accept that I've won, and if I can prove that I could have collected the part by just getting it fully in the ship's tractor beam, then I think it's perfectly fine to use some drone Pikmin just for the purpose of submitting them. However, we're actually in luck here. We don't have to break the rules again. Instead, there's a really cool alternative strat that we can use here that only requires one Pikmin. And all we gotta do is submit the ball borbs for money. They're two bucks each and they respawn infinitely, so we can technically enter the cave, kill and submit them, exit the cave, and then repeat until we win. The only issues with this are, one, time, this takes a couple full days to do, and no, I I don't mean in-game days, and two, since we gotta re-enter the cave over and over again, we have to do the insanely precise ball borb jump like a hundred times to keep skipping over the bags. Okay, it's not actually a hundred, <laughs> it's 451. But once we do all that, we can beat the game. Not only without making Pikmin, but also without having explored any of the rest of the areas, finding any of our other Pikmin, or doing any other cool tricks. Unfortunately though, I like fun challenges, and I banned turning in enemy corpses a while ago, so we can't do any of that nonsense. Instead, whenever we have to collect heavier objects like the Atlas, we'll have to settle with turning them in with drone Pikmin. But once we do, the first day finally comes to an end, and we'll be starting our second in the... the Awakening Wood, really, wow. Really, that, wow, okay. This place is massive, and it has a ton of different things to do and places to go. But I only had one goal locked in my brain as soon as I got here, and that was to get to the White Flower Garden. And no, I didn't zoom into the wrong spot, it's just another dang hole in the ground. This place is important, mostly because it houses our next Pikmin, but it also contains a surprise tool that will help us later. Getting to this cave, however, proved to be a bit of a problem. My first idea, getting there with the intended path, was absolute garbage. I used all two of my Pikmin and three full days knocking down this wall, only to come across another bag that requires a ton of weight to crush. Even if I could somehow find a nifty way to get around this, I couldn't just waste my limited time like that, so I instead turned my focus towards a different route. If I can somehow get over this tiny ledge, then I can access this whole part of the map from the back door. But I can't get over this ledge, not right now at least. Instead, I can get over an even bigger one. Oh! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh! Oh! <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm up! Holy! This is knockback extension, and it allows us to do some pretty wacky stuff. The way it works is weirdly simple. If one of the two captains gets hit by an enemy while the other captain is currently in a menu, then the knockback that the first guy receives from the hit will be extended forever. In this case, I set Olimar up with Jimmy and his father with a very particular position and angle. At that point, I switch to Louie and enter the menu right as Olimar gets bit, which sends him flying. At that point, so long as my initial positioning was good, then Olimar's extended knockback will allow him to slide up this wall and land on the map's border, completely out of bounds. From there, I have Louie toss over Bill and Stephanie so I can finally enter the White Flower Garden, where we come across some, uh, you know. And with all that, we finally hired the white guy, Tanner. And this guy's not great. He's pretty quick with it, destroys poison obstacles, and can find buried stuff, but I really only need him as an extra set of hands, and his lack of damage means his hands are pretty non-threatening. But in all honesty, enlisting our third Pikmin wasn't exactly my main goal here. Instead, after reaching the final floor and engaging in some less than intense combat with this cave's boss, we came across the five-man knapsack. Much like the spherical atlas, this thing isn't just a treasure, it's a special treasure. And from here on out, every cave is gonna have a final boss that drops a special treasure that grants us some sort of new ability. The knapsack in particular was especially interesting to me, as it allows us the ability to lay down, which, based on my experience with the last Pikmin game, seems like a pretty valuable thing to have in this challenge. However, the issue is that the knapsack weighs the dreaded weight of 15 pounds, meaning that we aren't able to carry it, even if we found all of our Pikmin types. And what's worse is that, unlike the Atlas, this floor doesn't have any enemies that we can use to nudge the knapsack back to our ship. It really seemed like there was no way that we would ever be able to collect it. So, knowing all that, this probably looks pretty weird, huh? As it turns out, almost every single one of those special treasures that I brought up has what's called a dynamic weight, which means it'll change depending on how many Pikmin you have. It's almost as if the developers knew that we would try this challenge, is what I would say if the challenge didn't already break the game multiple times in multiple ways that clearly aren't intentional, but don't worry about all that. What's important is that now we've got an army of three and the ability to snooze, and we've got to figure out what in the world to do with all that. Our main goal should still be to find the rest of our Pikmin types, but the two that remain are gonna be annoying. We're supposed to grab the yellows next, and these guys are chilling in the next area. The only issue is that unlocking the next area requires that we collect another dang globe, which is currently blocked off by a poisonous wall. And I'm not gonna let idiot McStupidbrain here take the next eight days to destroy this thing by himself, so we're not doing that. Unfortunately, our other option, the blue Pikmin, isn't that great of an alternative. They do have their own little zone in our current area, but its only entrance is blocked by an electrical gate, which usually requires those yellow guys. You know, 
usually. As it turns out, we can use our newly found knapsack to do a variety of crazy tricks here, which, when combined, allows for early blues. The trick first involves getting back on top of this ledge so we can access these blocks over here. I could use the knockback extension again, but it's way easier to just do this. This being the knapsack jump. By laying down, we turn ourselves into an object that can be carried back to the base by our Pikmin. However, our Pikmin are kinda dumb, and their pathfinding can often take some really wacky twists and turns when they're trying to figure out where to go. We can abuse this by laying down in a very specific area next to this ledge. Tanner picks me up and decides that the most efficient path from here to our base somehow involves first walking straight up this wall, at which point we can simply wake up to stop being carried and make our way to the blocks. Meanwhile, on the other side of the map, Louie and Bill start carrying back this nearby strawberry. This is another treasure, so collecting it will give us that cash money we're craving, but more importantly, it'll trigger a cutscene, which is important for the seesaw clip. This glitch involves these seesaw blocks, which usually rise and fall depending on which side has more weight in Pikmin. However, if we can trigger a cutscene as we're standing on a rising block, then during that cutscene, the block itself will continue to rise, but we ourselves will not, allowing us to clip straight through it. This gives us access to the inside of the wall, where we'll be pulling out our third insane trick in a row, the knapsack warp. See, as much as I'd love to just be able to waltz on over to the blue Pikmin from here, you can't. There's barely any floor to stand on in the wall here, so we just fall into the void if we try. However, unlike Stefan, this doesn't just kill us. Instead, there's a plane down here that teleports important objects like players and treasures back inbounds if they ever somehow get here. Player objects just get teleported back to the base, which isn't too useful, but treasures will respawn to a nearest waypoint, which are little points on the paths that treasures are intended to take when they're being carried. It just so happens that falling in this particular area makes the nearest treasure waypoint point right here, and it just so happens that laying down at this exact moment turns you into a treasure. That's right, we've busted in and reunited with our previous goat, Walter. And yeah, now we're stuck here and Walter's actually trash in this game, but that doesn't matter because now we only have one more Pikmin type to find before our army's complete. And we already know what we gotta do to get there. However, collecting the globe to unlock the next area isn't gonna be nearly as simple as it was last time. In fact, it's one of the hardest things to do in this entire challenge. The first step is to clear a path, both for us to reach the globe and for the globe to get back to our base. Like I've said, you're supposed to get here through this poison wall, but now that we've got the water-resistant Walter, we can instead build this bridge from the wrong side. This is not only faster, but it also solves both of our problems at once, as we can now access the globe and start it on its path to our ship. The only problem is that moving this thing is terrible. Again, it's way too heavy for us to carry, which means we have to use Pikmin nudging to get it to our base. We can't lay down behind the object to push it, that's not how it works in this game. Instead, we need enemies, but the only guy nearby is this dude, who can't be baited far enough to push it almost at all. However, we can push it a little bit, and at first I was actually content with this. After all, the enemy would respawn every day, so I could just repeatedly come back day after day and keep pushing them a tiny bit at a time. It would eat into my time limit, sure, but it'd eventually work, right? Well, it turns out that being hard to move is nowhere near the worst thing about this treasure. Oh my god, there's no way. There's no way. Even if I push it all the way over, it teleports back? Yeah, you're hearing that right. No matter how close you can manage to get this dang globe to your base, if you don't collect it that day, then it teleports all the way back to square freaking one. This is no longer a test of patience. No, no. This is now an insanely complex puzzle of time and resource management. We have to find out exactly what enemies we need to use to push this treasure all the way to our base over the course of only a single day. And this was my solution. The first order of business was to get a way better beginning. Although this flower dude is the closest enemy, the fact that we can't bait him far enough behind the treasure makes him a pretty bad candidate for the start of our path. But who could possibly be better than him? Every other enemy is way too far away, and baiting enemies across the entire map doesn't seem possible. Well, with one exception. This is the burrow knit, and this is burrow knit transportation. Although these guys do have a home, they prioritize murder over patrolling their little area. This means that, so long as you continuously stay close in front of them, you can bait them to walk as far away from their home as you want. The only problem now is that every single burrow knit on this map is blocked off by these two walls, which means that we're gonna have to take the time to at least destroy one of them. And although the dang poison gate that keeps cropping up has way less health, the fact that we can use our entire army of four to focus down the black wall here means that it's actually a significantly better option for us. I mean, it's still not great. And so, on day freaking six, we can finally start getting to work. My first move, of course, was to bait this burrow knit all the way across the map so I could get it properly behind the globe and push it a decent amount. And now, with all that set up, we've opened up a whole new world of enemies. And through this cycle of baiting, killing, and carrying enemies, we've gotten the globe to our landing site with little more than a single minute of the day remaining. But that's not close enough. We need to get it into our ship's tractor beam before the day's over 
or all of that progress is lost. The issue is that, unlike caves, in which enemies get turned into the same ship as treasures, we're currently above ground, and corpses are only ever carried to the onions. So then, how can I push the actual treasure towards the ship? Well, we can use Bill's strength to carry this bulb orb, alternate between using Stephanie and Walter to determine which of the two onions he should push the globe towards, and once everything's lined up, we can use Tanner's speed to finally take us home. And that is how we can collect the geographic projection and unlock the next area with only one of each Pikmin. Except for the 10 dudes that I need to actually submit it, but pfft, ignore those guys. Anyway, with that, we've unlocked the perplexing pool. And much like with the Awakening Wood, there's a million things to do here, but I've only got one on my mind. Usually you need to bust down, you guessed it, a poison wall to access these fellas, but y'all already know I ain't doing all that. And luckily enough, we can avoid it very simply by doing another knapsack jump to make it over the wall and meet up with Jordan the most mid dude of all time. But regardless, after seven whole days, we finally assembled the crew. From now on, this ragtag team of five Pikmin is gonna be all we got to tackle the rest of the game. Now that our full potential has been realized, we need to start putting all of our focus into getting our money up. However, as we've seen from the four treasures we've managed to collect so far, tackling them is an endeavor and a half. Taking huge time commitments, requiring crazy tricks, or relying on extremely niche mechanics. None of these were easy, you know. Except for the one. Yeah, remember that strawberry we got? Yeah, I mean, the seesaw clip it was attached to was a bit wacky, but the actual act of collecting it was super simple. We just had Bill deal with it. And as it turns out, this can be the case for most of the treasures in the entire game. This is why Bill is top tier. He can literally single-handedly collect a ton of objects for us without even needing drones. Add on our other boys and girl, and we've got a combined carrying strength of 14, which really ain't bad at all. And so the first step of getting that bag is gonna be putting Bill to work. First, let's tackle the above ground area of the perplexing pool, because we still got mad time here. Unfortunately though, only two of the seven objects up here are less than 15 pounds, the bottle opener and the fishing bob. The former is supposed to be collected with yellow dudes, as they're usually the only type that you can throw high enough to get it off its ledge. However, Jordan's too weak to make it happen, so we can instead get Bill up there by using the same knapsack jump from earlier to get some initial height. Yeah, there's probably like an irony joke in here somewhere, but I've already reached my funny quota in this video, so thankfully we can just move on. Unfortunately, the fishing bob makes moving on kind of difficult. It's inside of an enemy in the middle of the ocean, and I probably don't have to tell you that Walter ain't gonna cut it. What he can do, however, is drain the ocean by smacking this rock down here. Usually you have to build this bridge and snap the electrical gate to access it, but there's a really cool hidden mechanic in this game called throwing your Pikmin that you can do instead. It takes him a little bit, but Walter is eventually able to drain the water for us, at which point killing the enemy and carrying the treasure back is no problem for Bill. After that, all we gotta do is coerce Walter to kill and start carrying back a tadpole so we can whistle him from the other side of the gate, and we're out of day seven. Day eight, I decide to continue searching for a above ground treasures by heading over to the Awakening Wood. Here, there are technically three treasures that Bill can handle, but the toothpaste is beyond another electrical gate and a big undrainable body of water. And since I don't have enough days to build up Pikmin speed for 20 hours, this one's probably not gonna happen. Luckily, the other two aren't nearly as bad. The bulb is super simple to have Tanner dig up, and the car max is on another high ledge. Similar to last time, all I need is some extra height here so I can toss Bill high enough to grab it himself. And I can get that height by having the nearby burrow knit push me a little up this stump, which is just barely enough to make it work. And and that's it. That's all of the above ground treasures that we can get, which means that now we gotta go under. The thing is though, the caves in this game generally have much simpler level design than the main areas, mostly cause they don't have level design. Combine that with the fact that the caves completely pause the day timer, meaning we can be as slow and dumb as we want to with no consequences, and you've got some pretty easy and monotonous areas. Like the whole of Beast for example. Uh, you just saw the whole thing. I collected the light treasures, I didn't collect the heavy treasures, and at the end I beat up a boss and got a new ability that's really cool and not annoying. And that's what I do in pretty much every single cave. Heck, even back when I did the white flower garden for the white Pikmin and knapsack, I also happened to grab four of the treasures with Bill, and I bet you didn't even freaking notice. What I'm trying to say here is I'm not gonna be talking too much about what I do in each of the caves. Instead, what actually matters is whether or not I'm even able to access the cave, how much money Bill's able to get out of it, and the ability I unlock afterwards. So those are gonna be the main things I focus on. But if you really are interested in the caves, then you can check out all my uncut recordings of these things on my second channel, where you can find riveting moments like this. And so, with all that, let's get spelunking. 
The aforementioned Hole of Beasts and White Flower Garden were really easy to access and had a grand total of 1,010 bucks worth of light objects in them. As for the items, we're already pretty familiar with the one from the latter, and trust me, we'll get used to the former pretty dang soon. Next up is the Snagger Hole, which is a little bit more out of the way. I think you're supposed to build these bridges in order to access it normally, but since I'm not an idiot who wastes my dang time, I skipped all that by instead getting up this ledge with the knapsack jump. At that point, I sat there and did nothing for a couple minutes as my Pikmin broke down the wall in front of it. Once there, I grabbed 1,070 bucks and a Power Ranger dude, who just reduces the damage that Olimar and Louie take, which is not gonna lie, kinda useless. As for the Bullblack's Kingdom, getting past this electrical gate is gonna be a little bit more complex than just one knapsack jump. It's two knapsack jumps. After that, another relatively uneventful cave gave us a measly $710 and another Power Ranger for fire resistance, finishing off the Awakening Wood. On day nine, I decide to head back to the Perplexing Pool to continue my underground endeavors. The Citadel of Spiders earns its spot as the lamest cave in the entire game by being baby easy to access, having only $625 in there, and giving challenge mode as my reward. Challenge mode, what makes you think I want challenge mode? Glutton's Kitchen is a little bit more interesting in comparison, but it's also certainly more annoying. First off, I'm looking at something here, and I'll be honest, I'm not really enjoying it. Again, destroying this thing is not an option, but this time we can actually do a really neat trick to get past it. It's called a knapsack jump. Anyway, once I was in there, I was able to collect $710 and some electrical resistance, but I had to head back in a second time to grab an extra hundo. The reason I didn't get this treasure the first time around was because I actually couldn't. I haven't mentioned it yet, but most of the caves in this game are randomly generated, which means the enemies, treasures, and sometimes even the level geometry itself is determined by RNG just as you enter it. And as it turns out, the first layout that this sub-level gave me was one in which this bottom cap was completely out of my reach, which is kinda messed up. Luckily, things like this can be avoided by simply reloading the cave over and over until the game gives you a favorable layout, which might be something we'll have to get used to. Hey, speaking of things we're used to, check out what's blocking my path to the shower room. However, despite the fact that we've skipped every single electrical gate up to this point, this one is a little bit trickier, primarily because I couldn't find a way to knapsack jump past it. This means that we're gonna have to find another way, and with that I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there is an out-of-bounds trick that we can do right here, so we won't have to waste away our our days knocking it down with the one dude who can. The bad news is that we need a specific item to make it work. An item that's located in the Valley of Repose. Now I haven't been here since nine days ago, and that's for two really good reasons. Number one, and number two, Jimmy, who has been our only way to skip past this thing, despawned ages ago, so we're kind of stuck in the landing site. Unless we can find another way to get over this ledge, then we won't be able to access the rest of this area. Not only missing out on that item I want, but also missing out on what might be a ton of cash money from these treasures and these three caves. My first instinct, of course, was to try and find a knapsack jump, and it did look somewhat promising, but no matter what I did, I could never get all the way up the wall. The best I could do was get just high enough to start sliding on this edge, but that couldn't be enough right come on this has got to work this has got to work this is so cool if it works dude yes oh my god dude oh my god oh yeah by using an insanely precise sequence of knapsacks i was able to unlock the rest of the valley of repose is what i would say if this wall didn't exist yeah this thing's underwater so walter's the only one who can deal damage to it and despite my efforts there doesn't seem to be a way to skip past this one so sitting here for the next three days while he destroys it is our only option while he was doing that i went ahead and entered this emergence cave again so i could grab a bottle cap i forgot about and i had tanner dig up this nearby treasure to collect at the end of one of my days here the reason it has to be the end of the day is because the game poor thing still Still thinks we're in the tutorial, so collecting it forcefully ends the day. And so eventually we got to day 13, where Walter finally finished off the wall and took care of the drain afterwards so we could all make our way in. I could also have him build this bridge for us, but I took the speed route by instead painstakingly tossing my Pikmin over one at a time so I could get across the water without it. After that, we had clear access to our next cave, the Frontier Cavern. And hey, this one's actually really cool. The first floor has a really interesting enemy called the Stinky Poop Beetle. These guys, when attacked, drop Bitter Spray, which is insanely good. I haven't actually brought up the sprays yet, mostly because farming berries with only five Pikmin is incredibly slow at best and literally impossible at worst, but if we can get our hands on them, they'd be really good. The spicy spray increases increases the speed and attack power of our boys, which certainly can come in handy, but the more interesting one for us is the Bitter Spray, which turns enemies into stone. This would be extremely useful for later treasures, so I wanted to get as much of this Bitter Spray from these guys as I possibly could, which I did through a classic trick called Spray Duplication. This one's real simple. If there's spray on the ground, then you can usually collect it by having one of our captains slurp it up. But we got two captains, and if they both down it at the same time, then we get double the spray. There are a couple ways to do this, but I think the easiest is to first have whichever guy you're not controlling stand on top of it before dismissing him. And once he starts drinking, you can 
join on in. Doing all that gets me an additional eight sprays on top of that mystery one that no one's allowed to know about. Anyway, after a second floor that had literally nothing, we got to sub-level three, which has another cool enemy. And this one's probably gonna overshadow the last. This is the Baldman, the secret hidden sixth Pikmin type in this game that only exists in exactly two caves. Now these guys are obviously pretty great for us, but unfortunately we're still only allowed to have one of them, and killing the mother here gives you way more than just one guy. So then how are we ever gonna find a way to only get one? <laughs> Everyone, say hello to our lone Baldman Jimbo. This guy is fantastic. He is immune to everything, which I guess is pretty cool, but what makes him so good is the fact that he increases our combined carrying strength up to a clean 15. And I swear, the number of treasures that I couldn't collect in this challenge because they were just one pound too heavy for our quintet here is insanely high. But now, treasures like this guy are no problem for our newly formed, uh... Anyway, that's it. The rest of the cave is lame and Jimbo got left behind. At the end, we got ourselves the Run Fast Boots, which, you guessed it, makes us run fast. This is actually the item we wanted from this area, as the extra speed will allow us to do a trick that skips the electrical gate that we are stuck on earlier. But you know what else the run fast boots do? They make the double knapsack trick here impossible. Wait, what? The cave we actually explore first in this area isn't the Frontier Cavern, god no. Instead, we turned our attention to the subterranean complex. This place is blocked off by my previous nemesis, the Poison Wall, but at this point, these things are way less threatening than the Electric Gate. And I was able to just do a quick knapsack jump to easily skip past it. As for the cave itself, it's... <laughs> Got $795. Gave me something that lights up dark areas. <laughs> this place sucks, I'm getting out of here. After that, I went back into the Frontier Cavern and got the 1130 bucks from there before ending the day. And now that we have the Run Fast Boots, we apparently can do nothing else in the Valley of Repose forever, so we gotta get the rest of the money we need from these two zones. Luckily, also because of the Run Fast Boots, we can get some more of that cash in the perplexing pool. Because as it turns out, all we need to do to skip this gate is build the nearby bridge and make a run for it. Yeah, that's it. There's nothing to explain here. We, we really do just run that fast. Anyway, the actual cave itself went terribly. We only collected 450 bucks and our item just increased the radius of our whistle. Like, come on, dude. At this point, our repeated poor cave performances are starting to add up, as I only have 7,665 out of the $10,000 we need. And what's worse is that we only have a single cave remaining. And what's even worse is that the cave in question is the submerged castle. Now, if you're unaware, this place sucks, and it's the first time that even just entering the cave is a major issue. As you may have been able to tell, this cave is completely submerged underwater, meaning that you're only intended to bring blue Pikmin down here, which for us is one guy. But the thing is, there is no way around this. Even if you, oh, I don't know, use the run fast boost to get out of bounds, fall into the void, and warp into the landing site on top of some geometry that you can use to get even more out of bounds, to eventually reach this area where you can toss all five of your Pikmin across this gap and get them right at the cave entrance, it still won't let you bring any of your Pikmin except for the blue guy. This means that we're gonna have to somehow manage with only one of our worst Pikmin type. And you know, obviously we can't actually do anything. No treasure in this cave weighs one pound. And although we do reunite with Jimbo, nothing weighs two pounds either. All we can do in this cave is sit there and wait as Walter tries his best to bust down walls and rocks on his own. The only treasure we can get in here is the very last, as the game throws us a bone by allowing us to sacrifice Jimbo and tag Bill into the ring, who we can use to smack at the boss and collect the pluck phone which does nothing. $7,765 is our grand total after exploring every area and every cave, collecting as much as Bill and the others can manage on their own. But uh, now what? Well, we already have the answer to that question, don't we? Although we've spent the last eight days only collecting treasures that were light enough for our team of five to handle, it's still well within this challenge's rules to collect treasures with a little bit of help. So allow me to introduce our resident drone Pikmin, B17OC53. This guy's purpose is to sit there and do absolutely nothing until we can fully transport a treasure to our ship, at which point he can help us submit it. So without further ado, let's revisit some of these caves with a fresh set of eyes. The Hole of Beasts is first up, and it does a great job of showing how the cave's random generation starts getting a little interesting now that we have some new goals. For example, the extremely valuable Game & Watch that we've yet to collect here is found inside of My Man Jim on sub-level 4. This is actually great for us, because it means that we don't have to push the treasure with enemies at all, and instead can get away with baiting Jim over to our ship first, and then killing him right on top of it. 
The issue though is that Jim's placement on the map relative to our ship is random, and sometimes he's too far away to bait over, so we have to deliberately manipulate a cave layout that places him close enough. This is a really simple example, but for future more complex treasures, using the game's randomness against it is going to become a major factor. However, as this cave also demonstrates, the level generation can't just do everything for us. The floppy disk on sub level 2, no matter what, always spawns a decent distance away from my ship, and with no enemies on this floor to help push it, this renders this treasure impossible for us to collect. And yeah, the prospect of impossible treasures is pretty dang scary when we still have so much money to get, so we're gonna have to pick it up a bit in the white flower garden. This place also has two treasures that we previously missed out on, but the tape seems to be another extremely unlikely one. It's again on a floor with no variation in level generation and no enemies to speak of. The shoe polish on floor one, however, is a bit more promising. It has the same layout every time, but it has a bunch of sheer grubs in the center that we might be able to use to push it closer. The problem is that, much like Jim, these guys can't be baited very far from their home, which makes it look like another impossible one. But here's where all that bitter spray I farmed up finally comes into play. This is rock nudging, an almost entirely foolproof way to get enemies where you want them. The basic idea is that burping on enemies with this stuff and turning them into stone changes their properties in such a way that allows them to be pushed around just by walking into them. So then, as long as we have enough spray, we're able to move enemies way further from their homes than they're supposed to be. So we can use rock nudging here to push this guy behind the treasure and get it to the center of the map. At that point, we can just bait the rest of the enemies here like normal to very slowly collect another treasure. And this was insanely stupid. See, this shoe polish only gave me 80 bucks, and I had to use nearly all of my spray for it. Combine that with the fact that the only good way for me to get spray is now locked in the one area I can't access anymore, and we're kind of in trouble all of a sudden. This means that we need to start being a little bit more picky about which treasures we collect, because our limited time and resources are quickly starting to catch up with us. So that's why I decided to completely ignore the yogurt once I got to the snagger hole. It would require a non-zero amount of spray to get, and the 30 bucks it'd give is nowhere near enough to be worth it. However, the other two treasures that I missed here might be a bit more promising. The Whistle is another one that spawns inside of an enemy, but this guy is way harder to bait around, and it doesn't seem possible for him to spawn right on top of my ship. So instead, I had to reset for a layout that put him right next to my ship, as well as some nearby bulb orbs that I could use to actually push it. And so, once I got that layout, all I had to do was execute. Sublevel 2, on the other hand, was just a little bit harder to bend to my will. A lot of the terrain here is completely impossible to push a treasure through, and the cake that I need seems to always spawn in a corner like a mile away from my ship. So I had to manipulate a layout that at least made that mile a straight shot, and from there I could use some burrow net transportation to get it out of its little corner, making the treasure surprisingly easy to push back and collect. What won't be easy, however, is the Bullblack's Kingdom, which has five treasures that we were too weak to carry last time, all of which are worth collecting. Luckily, the Crystal Clover actually is pretty easy, it's just in another bulb orb. And hey, the shell and the sprout were also fairly simple. For both of them, I just needed a layout in which a couple enemies spawned close enough to where they were buried so I could push them right on out of there. The two treasures on the next floor, however, were a little less simple. Both of them require specific and different conditions. Conditions, so I had to come back to this cave twice to collect these things separately. The first was another jam inside of another bulb orb, so y'all already know what I had to do for that one, but the skull was a bit more complex. I needed a very specific combination of level chunks and enemy spawns. In particular, I wanted it to be placed relatively near my base, with bulb orbs close enough to be behind it, and a nearby dweevil. These guys can actually pick up and carry objects for us, and although this sounds extremely good, they unfortunately can't walk very far with them. We can, however, briefly use them to transport treasures across shorter distances, which is exactly why I wanted this precise layout to eventually get the skull right to my ship. And after all that, we pretty much got everything we can in the Awakening Wood. I could also try for the three above ground treasures here, but since our time in the day actually passes up here, collecting these is pretty infeasible. So I instead use this time to grind out one more bitter spray from these nearby berries before again returning to the perplexing pool on day 16. However, our luck from the Awakening Wood didn't seem to transfer to this area almost at all. With our limited spray, only one of the two treasures from the Citadel of Spiders was actually worth collecting with rock nudging. And the Glutton's kitchen was even worse, with literally none of the remaining treasures here being collectible for our non-spray having selves. And beyond that place, I couldn't even bring my drone Pikmin into the submerged castle if I wanted to, which left only the shower room to collect the remaining $1,000. And that's just not doable. Although I could get some treasures that were in enemies, near enemies, or near helpful terrain, getting that many things was just not feasible, especially considering that I've run completely dry on spray at this point. And even if some of these were possible to collect for us, there was no way they all were, and all of them is exactly what I need. I ended off the 16th day with still $800 to earn. Somehow, in the next three days, I needed to collect almost every single one of the completely infeasible treasures that I just mentioned, with rock nudging completely off the table. All of a sudden, right at the end here, 
things were looking insanely bleak. And so after thinking on it for a while, brainstorming different ways to transport the remaining treasures and trying to put together the floors in ways that just might make some of them collectible, I settled on only one possibility, the Valley of Repose. Once again, I find myself here searching for answers to impossible questions. And once again, I'm only thwarted by a single god dang ledge. If I can just find another way to get past it, then I'd not only have access to as much bitter spray as I could ever ask for in the Frontier Cavern, but I'd also have access to what might just be the last of the treasures we need. But how in the world are we gonna do that? Now that Jimmy's been despawned, the Bulborb jump is no longer an option. And now that I have the Run Fast boots, the Double Knapsack jump isn't one either. And as far as I can tell, there is no other known way to get up and over this ledge. Until now. Please. <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> Oh yeah, by starting a knapsack jump and then doing an insanely precise whistle on just the Pikmin as they're at the peak of the jump, then you're able to get a captain stuck on the edge as they're laying down. And from there, all we gotta do is a couple more jumps to slowly nudge them further on the ledge until they're finally able to get up, skipping these stupid freaking bags for the third time in a row. And now that we're past them and have access to three more caves, we're all but home free. I first made my third visit to the emergence cave so I could grab the extremely valuable orange. This floor's layout is almost always the exact same, but I'm not complaining because it's also perfect for pigment nudging, immediately putting us back on track for paying back our debt. After that, I skipped the ledge once more to make a visit to the Frontier Cavern, where I stocked back up on Bitter Spray and comfortably used it to collect the remaining treasures that I left here last time. And with all the momentum in the world, I skipped the ledge for a third time and headed on into the subterranean complex. Except it's here, where things get a little rough. See, the floors in this cave are kind of infamously the stupidest and the dumbest in the entire game, which makes collecting the treasures here, even with our spray numbers up, nearly impossible. And the most unlikely of them all also happens to be the most important. Another dang bottle cap. This guy costs $300, the most out of every single treasure in the game. It doesn't matter if I can't collect any of the other objects from here, from the shower room, from the submerged castle, from anywhere. If I can find a way to just get this one treasure, then our goal will finally be completed. The issue is that the floor it spawns on is almost completely hopeless. First off, this place is huge, and the treasure generally prefers to spawn approximately a million miles away every single time. The thing is, this wouldn't even be the biggest problem in the world if it weren't for the fact that the enemies here are all terrible. There are a grand total of four dudes, and they all suck. This guy just immediately blows up, and we can't use him at all. And the guy who literally never moves from a singular spot here isn't too great either. As for the other version of this guy, he actually can be baited around quite a bit, but once he's killed, his corpse actually regenerates health until he comes back to life, meaning we constantly have to kill him almost every Every single time we nudge the treasure like an inch, which would take about as long as the version of this challenge that allows enemy corpses. But all that doesn't actually matter, because as we've seen throughout this entire challenge, just one enemy isn't enough to push a treasure all the way to my ship. And the other guy here is truly terrible. He not only can't be baited around, but he can't even be rock nudged, making this treasure in its entirety seem impossible. But I kinda lied. These four guys aren't the only enemies on this floor. In fact, it's not even close. And so, after one last manipulation to get a floor layout that places the treasure a little less than a million miles away, and places the main enemy straight into the abyss, I pulled out one last trick from my hat, egg nudging. A trick that turns an impossible challenge into an easy one. And so, with this last treasure collected, we can- ah oh shoot, I'm still short 25 bucks, ah! Uh and so, with this actually last treasure collected, our debt completely repaid, and our rocket ready to return home, we can finally answer the question. Is it possible to beat Pikmin 2 with only one of each Pikmin? Well, no, I mean, we had to crush that bag in the beginning, remember? That's, that's kind of nonsense, though, it wasn't my fault. And I guess drone Pikmin are also kind of against the rules, although this challenge is still technically possible with the corpse. So wait a minute, I forgot about Louie! <laughs> Welcome to the Wistful Wild, the actual last area in this game. Fortunately, money is no object to us anymore, so we can completely avoid every treasure and cave here and just focus on rescuing our boy. I mean, how stupid would I have to be to go completely out of my way? To find out that the Cavern of Chaos is free to access and has 1,630 bucks worth of light objects and that the Hole of Heroes, though blocked by an electrical gate, can be accessed to the back route by simply walking out of bounds a la Pikmin 1 to get the $2,075 in there. I mean, yeah, I'd have to be an idiot to do all that. Anyway, the actual place we want to go is the Dream Den, which is usually blocked by a real strong poison wall. However, although I can coerce this guy to shoot away the poison things and have all my Pikmin destroy it, I am still technically on a time limit here. So instead, I can just do one final knapsack jump for the road, have the president toss me all my Pikmin, and head right on in. 
And after a good amount of time completely ignoring the nightmare floors of this cave, we reached the final boss. Which may or may not have taken a full hour to kill, but once we did, we could take back our treasure. Not the actual treasure, no no, it's way too heavy. But we can at least grab Louie. And so now, we can actually actually answer the question of the video. And the answer is unfortunately still no. But much like the treasures in this final area, though we can't do everything with only one of each Pikmin, we at least got some of the cool stuff. And honestly, to me that's all that really matters. Hey, welcome to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and hey, if you did, make sure to do all of those YouTube things, especially commenting. That one's my favorite. I read all my comments. And also, if you want, consider supporting me on Patreon. All of the amazing people you're seeing on screen right now are already supporting, and they're already receiving some really cool behind-the-scenes content of this channel. And if that's something you're interested in, then go ahead and check it out. But if you're not interested, uh, then yeah, that's it.